from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We're going to start today with the presidential election, with the attention of both campaigns consumed over the last 24 hours with the explosive reporting from Bob Woodward's new book about the president's handling of the coronavirus, something that the president himself addressed yesterday soon after those reports came out. We don't want to have to show panic. We're not going to show panic. And that's exactly what I did. And I was very open, whether it's to Woodward or anybody else. It's just another political hit job. But whether it was Woodward or anybody else, you cannot show a sense of panic or you're going to have bigger problems than you ever had before. For her analysis of the politics of the Woodward book, we welcome now Bloomberg political contributor Jeannie Zano. She's professor of political science at Iona College. So this was quite a blockbuster for all of us yesterday, Jeannie. Explain exactly what the p potential political ramifications would be of the disclosure that the president was telling Bob Woodward back in March this was terribly deadly, really contagious, even at the same time he was sort of saying to the rest of us, don't worry about it so much. Well, uh, you know, this is not the conversation the president wants to be having because, of course, any talk of the pandemic doesn't work for him politically. So this is not what the campaign wants to be talking about. But more importantly, we have a president on the record admitting he knows just how devastating and deadly this is. And many months later, you have 190,000 Americans dead, many more have been sick and ill as a result of this. And you had the president, months after he told Bob Woodward how, how bad this was, inviting people to places like Tulsa and saying, you don't have to worry about safety protocol. You don't have to worry about masking. You don't have to worry about social distancing. This is just being drummed up by people who want to get me. And of course, when he's on the record with Bob Woodward, he's saying the opposite. So the president and his team have now got to explain why he is saying one thing privately to Bob Woodward and another one publicly, and not just to the American public, which is bad enough, but to his supporters who put their lives on the line as they went to these rallies. You know, many thousands didn't show up, but those that did, and we know people were sick as a result of that, not the least of which was Herman Cain, who is now no longer with us, not to say that we know he got it there. So this is a devastating report for the campaign either way. And the one thing people keep asking is why the heck would he talk to Bob Woodward, which seems to be the, pre the question every president is asked after they speak to Bob Woodward on the record. I was going to say, it's not it's not unique to <laughs> President Trump that Bob no. Woodward gets people to tell him things that they shouldn't be telling him, no question about it. But you're a professor of political science. What about the president? We just heard him, what he said yesterday, soon after the reports. He said, I'm not apologizing for anything. I'm doing what a leader does. I'm trying not to panic my people. Is there something to that argument? He is going to be making that argument. He's also going to try to muddy the waters by saying, look, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, same time that, you know, Nancy Pelosi inviting people to visit Chinatown. You know, Joe Biden wasn't any more on top of this than we were, than I was. So he's going to try to muddy that, that, that way. There is no good way out of this. Sure, you don't want to panic the American public, but there's a big distance between panic and being honest and telling people to please be safe because this is a dangerous situation. And, you know, more than anything, we want our leaders to keep us safe, whether it's from insurrection at home, terrorism, you know, whatever it is, but certainly a pandemic. So this is a hard thing for the president to walk back now that he is on the record and he can't claim it's the fake media. His own words are there making this case on tape. And also it strikes me that the president and what he said puts the focus firmly on what he did, whatever he was saying at the time, if he really understood it to be as deadly as it was, as contagious, then I would think that he would have to do an awful lot behind the scenes. Maybe we didn't know about it. I'm not sure whether that happened or not. Maybe we'll find out. We're going to have to find out. You know, they're trying to put Fauci forward now. They're trying to make the case that he did a lot to address this. But the fact is, as we look at the polls, the American public, even supporters, don't feel like he handled the situation well. So this is definitely not what he wants to be talking about as we are in the height of campaign season right now. And he is out on the trail trying to make his case for a second term. Now, part of the defense of the president, uh, by way of tweet, actually, is to attack Bob Woodward to say, basically, uh, he had my quotes for many months, if he thought they were that bad or dangerous, why didn't he immediately report them? Is there something to that point? If this was really such a smoking gun, so to speak, why did Bob Woodward sit on it for several months? You know, I, 
I, I think that he can raise that point. Um, you know, Bob Wardler obviously reporting this out in a book, but I'm not sure it would have been any different if Bob Woodward had released these tapes several months ago or now. The president would have still taken exception to that. So, sure, I, you know, let Bob Woodward respond to that in the Washington Post, however he and they want to respond to it. But for the president, all of this talk of Bob Woodward, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi doesn't change the fact for him politically. He is president. There was and is a pandemic, and he is responsible for handling that. And the American public, if it's the issue on their mind when they go to the polls, are going to be voting at least in part on his handling of that. Well, that's the question I have, actually. How important is, is this to the voters, and particularly key voters in battleground states, or particularly the women we talk about all the time in the suburbs? How important is this issue, the handling of the coronavirus? Because let's be frank, there have been disclosures in the past for President Trump that people thought were really going to hurt him, like the Access Hollywood tapes. It didn't touch him. You didn't touch him. We're hearing now the latest polls out of Monmouth and others show that the comments about the military not having an impact on people's vote. So I don't think we quite know yet whether this will have an impact. But let's be clear. There are people struggling with this now. We talk about the women in the suburbs or women and parents everywhere who are making really hard choices today about how to send their kids to school safely, whether they have to take time off work to do that and be home with their children, whether they have to think about leaving their jobs as their children can't go to school. So this is impacting people's lives today. And the polls do show it is one of the key issues on people's mind as they're voting. Will it change people who were supporters of Trump to not support him? I'm not so sure. But this is such a tight race and will be such a tight race. It's not what the president wants to be talking about now, not what his campaign wants to be talking about. That's why we hear him talking about a vaccine before the end of the year. So he wants to turn the page on this desperately. And what Bob Woodward has done now is he has opened this up for people to talk about and reflect on whether they think the president handled this appropriately. And of course, we've got a Congress which still hasn't passed a second bill on this as well. So by any stretch, things in Washington don't look good, and he is the president, and he can't run away from that. That's sure for true. Sure. Okay, thank you so much, Jeannie. Always great to have you with us. That's Jeannie Zeno. She's Bloomberg political contri contributor for us. Coming up, plenty of news out of Europe. The ECB pledges to watch the surging euro while the EU talks tough on a new UK Brexit law. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. It's likely to be the final stage of the months-long battle over fiscal stimulus. The Senate votes today whether to advance a slimmed-down Republican pandemic relief bill. Democrats say they have the votes to block the measure. It's not clear if that will lead to more negotiations. Democrats want a much larger bill than Republicans will go for. The United States is ending its COVID-19 screening of international travelers arriving at airports. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention had been testing passengers on all flights from high-risk areas to 15 U.S. airports. The CDC says the system wasn't effective because so many people who transmit the disease don't show symptoms. The government says it will now focus more on voluntary measures such as educating passengers and requesting contact information electronically. President Trump is pushing ahead with a visit to Nevada this weekend, even after coronavirus restrictions nixed his plans for a big rally. The Trump campaign had scheduled a 5,000-person rally at an airport hangar in Reno, but the airport told a private aviation company that would violate state restrictions and raise security concerns over protests. The president's state campaign co-chair is calling it partisan political retribution from Nevada's Democratic governor. Iran began its annual military drills today near the strategic Strait of Hormuz. The so-called war games are taking place amid escalating tensions between the United States and Iran. Iranian state media showed footage of various short-range missiles and jet fighters being launched. Units from the Iranian Navy, Air Forces and Ground Forces are taking part in those drills. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. 
I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Mm -hmm. The European Central Bank today held steady on both rates and its bond buying program, reflecting a careful balance between signs of recovery and continued risk to the European economy, even as ECB President Madame Lagarde warned of the risks to the downside. Overall, the balance of risks to the euro area growth outlook is seen to remain on the downside. This assessment largely reflects the still uncertain economic and financial implications of the pandemic. We welcome now Stephanie Flanders. She is senior executive editor for economics at Bloomberg. So, Stephanie, thank you so much for being here. You heard Madame Lagarde say the risks are to the downside. At the same time, some people at least came away from that news conference saying, if anything, she sort of painted a rosier picture than they thought. Yeah, and the language, uh, certainly the formal language out of this meeting uh, was exactly the same as at the last meeting, pointing to the fact that risks were on the downside. But coming into it, I think there were a number of people in the markets considering the data in the last few weeks in Europe had not been so great that you've seen the recovery leveling off and even starting to go down, the momentum sort of weakening in quite a few European countries. We were wondering whether she would sound even more downbeat. And in fact, uh, as you suggest, you know, the overall tone of her press conference was, uh, if anything, upbeat. And we actually have heard, uh, Bloomberg had heard soon after the meeting that some members of the council had wanted to be even more upbeat in their language and had, had been overruled. So are they seeing something in the numbers? Because the numbers they had came up marginally. I mean, they're not cheery economic numbers, but nevertheless, whether it's GDP growth or whether it's inflation, they come up slow months since the last estimate. Yeah, I mean, there was no there was no big change in the forecast, but you're quite right. The growth forecast was just a tiny bit better, but they're still expecting a big hole to be missing in the European economy at the end of the year due to due to the COVID recession. The inflation numbers looking a little bit higher, uh, but actually that probably doesn't take into account the fact that the euro has been soaring, soaring in the markets in the last few weeks. So it's it would certainly this is not a time when you would think that they would be changing their uh, their signaling around risk. And if anything, as you know, many people in the financial markets are expecting them to have to do more to stimulate the eurozone economy before the end of the year. Stephanie, you mentioned the, the euro soaring. It really has been on an uptick, without a doubt. And that poses some challenges for the European Central Bank because the higher the euro goes, the harder it is to get the inflation up, which is their target there. Madame Lagarde did address that, so they talked about it a fair amount, although she didn't seem to be overly concerned. Yeah, and this, if anything, is the first time we've seen a shift in the Lagarde ECB relative to the European Central Bank under her predecessor, Mario Draghi, where the, the exchange rate, although, of course, they don't formally say they're targeting the exchange rate, the exchange rate seemed to loom really large in their strategy for stimulating the economy. They always wanted to keep it down to help exporters, to help the economy. She was sounding, and I, we get the impression that the council overall was not so concerned about uh, the level of the euro or the fact that it's likely maybe to go up uh, further. And that, that, that is a shift, and it's going to make it harder, as you say, to hit that inflation target, they, which at the moment they have no sign of hitting. It looks like in two years' time the core inflation rate will still be only 1.1 per cent, so really half of the target they're trying to reach. Now, they've indicated, as I understand it, that their extraordinary bond buying program will go through the middle of next year, but some people thought she might extend that. When do they have to really address that question of when they go even further with that program? Yeah, there's an interesting debate on the council about whether the amount that they've previously talked about for the special program, the 1.35 trillion euros, was a ceiling or just a sort of overall amount that they're going to spend and then they might think about spending more. Um, they don't have, they can keep up the bond purchases, as you say, through the middle of next year. There's no particular moment where they're going to have to announce a bigger envelope. Uh, but I think a lot of people in the financial markets, if you continue to see this trajectory of the economy, the recovery kind of bottoming out, flattening out, um, not continuing, if you like, that last bit of the V, I think there will be quite a lot of uh, question mark about whether they should increase the bond purchases at the end of the year or at least announce that it's going to increase uh, and extend longer than the middle of uh, 21. Stephanie, as you know well, in the United States, we really focus particularly on the jobs numbers every month and trying to figure out where the economy is. Give us a sense of the employment situation over in Europe, because it's done relatively well, as I understand it. But I also heard that there, some of these furlough programs may be expiring at some point. 
you know, every government is facing the same challenge. And it's a version of the challenge that the uh, lawmakers are facing in the U.S. over the stimulus package, but kind of in reverse. The U.S. has had a lot more people join the unemployment rolls, and then they have a debate about whether or not to keep those increased benefits going or not, or try and reintroduce them. In Europe, you have a lot of people who are no, not unemployed yet. They've managed to suppress, if you like, the, un the rise in the unemployment rate they might have seen because they have these furlough programs or versions of it where the government is basically paying employers to keep people on their books as an enormous program that was supposed to run out at the end of October in the UK similar programs in Europe different countries are taking different decisions on this Germany has said it's going to extend its program Spain is saying it's going to end its program in September but uh, there will be a lot of different country de difficult debates in different countries about that in the next few weeks because at the moment the unemployment rate much lower than in the US because they have managed to keep those people on the books but still effectively paid by the government, supported by the government. Stephanie, I think it's fair to say back in the United States, we start, saw a rather rapid uptick in the economy, May, June, and now, although it is keeping to come back, it's returning, it's doing it more and more slowly. Is that the same situation you're watching in Europe? Yes, and for a while it looked like the Eurozone would actually come out of this quicker, better than the U.S., in part maybe because they had kept people uh, off the formal unemployment rolls. But it, there seems to be a sort of natural stopping point that economies are getting to maybe uh, 8 or 9 or 10 percent below their normal level of activity. When you look at those high frequency numbers, the Google mobility, all those things that we're now looking at for a more timely indicator, we seem to be seeing countries flattening out at around the same level. And, you know, we, we, we got used to those big numbers, so it seems like we've got a lot of the economy back relative to the, the worst moment in the recession. But relative to any normal recession, you're still talking about a big hole that we haven't dug ourselves out of yet. So, Stephanie, you mentioned the United Kingdom, and that's made the news as well this week with some uh, growing uncertainty over Brexit, as if we didn't have enough already, with Boris Johnson, the prime minister, saying, you know, maybe we will renege on the deal involving Northern Ireland. His minister actually saying in parliament it violated international law, and then the EU coming back and saying, you've got to the end of the month to say you're going to stick with the deal. Yeah, and they just keep raising the ante to make us have to talk about Brexit, although maybe it becomes, a, it almost comes as a relief after months and months dominated by COVID that we're now back to the crazy talk around uh, Brexit. But this is quite a, an extraordinary development we've had this week with the Conservative Prime Minister, Conservatives in the UK normally associated with the rule of law and uh, keeping strong or to legal traditions, basically admitting that the bill that they're introducing into Parliament will violate, par allow them to violate parts of the deal that Boris Johnson did with European officials uh, before the end of the year. So remember, he had that election where he was able to say, I was the one who was able to deliver Brexit. And really, he had, he had agreed to a deal that his predecessor had not wanted to sign up to because it suggested that you might have border controls between the UK and Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland, formerly part of the UK, but border, border controls between the two to preserve, uh, preserve what was going on in Ireland. And now he's kind of suggesting, well, I don't like that bit of the deal. So we're, if we don't get a new trade agreement with Europe, we're going to reserve the right to uh, not enforce some of that deal completely against international law, and the Europeans have said they will take him to court if it goes ahead within the next month. Stephanie, as far as we can determine, what's the thinking about what the method is behind what some would call madness here? I've seen it suggested that actually Boris Johnson has taken a hard look at situations saying, look, I need to be able to give state aid to my tech uh, industry more than I need uh, good trade relations with the EU, that actually he's willing, he's actually willing to do a hard Brexit. And it's a funny situation. Again, we have conservatives are traditionally associated with not wanting to support uh, prop up ailing industries or give special support to different uh, sectors. So it's odd that that should be the, the sticking point. The fishing policy is the other. Access to British fish uh, is the other sticking point. Obviously, a tiny percentage, 0.01%. Uh, of the economy, I think, or 0.1%. Um, it's, it's hard to read, except that maybe he is making it even more likely that the Europeans walk away from any deal and he gets to blame them for any carnage that happens in January. But it's very high stakes. Stephanie, always great to have you with us. Thank you for your time. That's Stephanie Flanders of Bloomberg Economics. Still ahead here, interviews with two former Democratic presidential candidates, Deval Patrick and Tom Steyer. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for the stock of the hour. Citi announced a transition at the top as CEO Michael Corbett announced his plans to step down after the first of the year and turn leadership over to Jane Fraser, which would make her the first woman ever to run a major global bank. For a review of Citi's performance in recent years, we welcome now Scarlett Fu. Scarlett. Hi, David. Well, it's about time. Jane Fraser is stepping in to lead Citi, and she's a former partner at McKinsey. She's been at the firm since 2004. She's led Citi's consumer unit, its private bank, and Latin American operations. And this year, she's had the challenge of leading the bank through the uh, pandemic, uh, especially making plans for returning workers to the office. Paul Sweeney of Bloomberg Radio, who's a former sell-side analyst, points out that Jane Fraser's appointment is another example of the rising prominence of the consumer side of the bank versus, say, the investment bank. Citi is the world's biggest credit card issuer, so it is in the front lines of dealing with persistently high unemployment leading to potential bad loans. Now, the surprise to me, David, is not that Fraser was named CEO. The firm telegraphed as much when she was named president. That was a position that marked her as the heir apparent. Uh, but the surprise is in the timing. She was just named last year, and there were reports that Corbett would stay on as CEO for another two years. Yes, yeah, fascinating. And it might have been influenced by the fact you remember down in Congress when the heads of the banks testified, they were asked specifically, could they see a woman succeeding them? And Corbett said specifically that he could. He could see that in the cards. At the same time, there's also questions about the board of directors of some of these big banks. How does the city board look? The board matters. That's what it comes down to. I credit the city board of directors because I was looking at the Bloomberg function MGMT Go, and I checked, and city leads the big banks when it comes to women on its board. It's got 17 members, so it's a pretty big board. Uh, eight of those members are women, so that's 47 percent. The next closest would be Goldman Sachs with uh, 36 percent, four out of 11 members. Bank of America, 35 percent, JPM, 30 percent, and Morgan Stanley and Wells Fargo in the 20 percent range. Mike Corbett will actually stay on the city board through next February. Now, when you look at what he's done over the eight years that he's led the firm, he guided city out of a tricky position. It's near collapse following the global financial crisis. He shrunk city's operations. He returned it to consistent profitability, but according to analysts, including Mike Mayo of Wells Fargo, not enough to achieve internal targets. Citi's stock has an average 7.2 percent annualized return under Corbett's watch, and it's trailed other banks, so Jane Fraser has her work cut out for her. Thank you so much to Scarlett Fu for their report on Citi. Up next, President Trump is drawing down U.S. troops in Iraq. We talk with retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett about what this means for the country and the region. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go down to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Bloomberg's learned that the Trump administration may give TikTok's Chinese owners more time to line up a sale. ByteDance is likely to miss President Trump's September 15th deadline for selling TikTok's U.S. operations to an American buyer. That's because Beijing would need to sign off on any deal. The president's advisors haven't given him their recommendation on a new deadline yet. Western Europe has surpassed the United States in new daily infections, reemerging as a global hotspot after bringing the pandemic under control earlier in the summer. Cases have been on the rise in Spain, France, and other European nations. The region reported more than 27,000 new infections in the past 24 hours. The U.S. reported 26,000. In Beirut, a huge fire has broken out at the port a little more than a month after a massive explosion there. The Lebanese army says the fire is at a warehouse where oil and tires are stored. Last month's explosion killed more than 190 people, injured around 6,500, and damaged thousands of buildings in the Lebanese capital. J.P. Morgan has found that some of its employees improperly received coronavirus relief funds intended for American businesses. Bloomberg has learned the bank noticed that suspicious amounts of money had been deposited into workers' checking accounts. Some employees have been fired. J.P. Morgan isn't commenting. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. 
I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks very much, Mark. The Trump administration yesterday announced it would cut U.S. troops deployed in Iraq once again, this time going from 5,200 to 3,000 by the end of this month. We welcome now retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. General Kimmett has served as an Assistant Secretary of State and a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. So, General, thank you so much for being with us. Give us a sense about the strategic goal here in Iraq as we continue to cut that back forces. Is that because we're so confident of the country, or are they sort of nudging us out? Well, it, it's a little bit of both. Uh, ever since the end of the fight against ISIS, there has been less and less need for U.S. troops there. We were down to virtually no combat forces at the end of 2011, and it was only the emergence of ISIS that took us back in. Uh, we've trained, we've equipped, we've fought with the Iraqi security forces. They're pretty competent in fighting the, the ground operations. Uh, even though we are pulling out, we will still have overwatch forces, and we'll still be, be providing intelligence and air support. Uh, Iraq, sadly, in many ways, has become almost a surrogate place where we sort of have a, a tussle with Iran, its neighbor. Uh, it, what does this mean for Iran? Does this give them more elbow room uh, to operate in Iraq? Well, it certainly has them uh, in a position of more influence. But this new prime minister has made it very, very clear that he says, look, we don't want U.S. forces here. We don't want Iranian forces here. This is our job. Uh, we don't mind influence, uh, but we do mind interference. We've heard repeatedly from President Trump that basically ISIS or Islamic State has been totally defeated. It's gone. Is that true? Because we've heard in other places around the world we thought that the terrorists were gone and they've come back. Well, uh, defeat is a military term. That means that the opposing force is no longer capable of conducting large-scale operations. And that's true. ISIS's caliphate is destroyed. Uh, its ability to mount large military operations has been destroyed, uh, and as a result, they've been defeated. However, are they gone? No, they are still a terrorist organization inside of Iraq. They're still capable of conducting terrorist operations, but to suggest that they are a major existential threat either to Iraq or to anyone in the surrounding region, uh, I think the Iraqi security forces have taken care of that, and they and they are well managing the ISIS threat in the country now. So, so Mark, you don't need me to tell you you were in charge of uh, planning for CENTCOM at one point, as I recall. That region is a hotbed, uh, one place or the other, for the United States. If we pull back to 3,000 troops in Iraq, do we have other forces in the region that we can continue to have a stabilizing force, one would hope? Yeah, uh, certainly, David. I mean, we've had thousands and thousands of troops in the region. We do today, uh, mostly on a rotational basis. But we have a significant ground component, an air component, and, of course, we have the aircraft carriers inside the Persian Gulf. But they're no longer there to fight wars. They're there as a deterrence and as a stability force so that uh, anyone who wants to create a significant amount of, in, of instability in the region needs to understand that we can react to that if necessary. What are the greatest uh, threats to the U.S. interests in that region at this point? Is it Iran? Uh, when we wrote the CENTCOM strategy in 2006, the major threats were enemies protecting our friends, weapons of mass destruction, proliferation, uh, access to strategic materials. Well, obviously, we're doing much better than we were then in terms of strategic materials, but certainly Iran, uh, with its ever-increasing missile capability and perhaps nuclear capability, remains a threat, if not from actual conflict, but from blackmail and uh, coercion. And on the other hand, there are proliferation of resistance forces, as they call them, Hezbollah, Qatab, Hezbollah, in the region that can destabilize governments. And, of course, you have the terrorist threats. So there's, there, there are no lack of threats that could destabilize the region and, as a result, uh, have a backwash over the United States as well. What is the level of activity by Iran right now, as far as you can assess it, uh, the, those surrogate uh, terrorist efforts throughout the region? There's something that President Trump certainly focused on. Has the Trump administration curtailed that at all? Uh, no, and I don't think any of the administrations before have either. We used to talk about Iranian influence, then we would talk about the Iranian Shia crescent. It's really an encirclement of the region right now. Iran is a revolutionary 
uh, country, and it has to continue to promote that revolution. We see them with forces in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, in the eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia, inside of Bahrain. Uh, about the only country that uh, is immune is Oman, simply because they've had a relationship with Iran over the years. So they are a presence, they're a disruptive presence, and uh, they're an unhelpful presence. Okay, thank you so very much. That's retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. I'm happy to say we're going to have more with him coming up on our second hour on Bloomberg Radio. Coming up here, we talk with former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick about candidate Biden's approach to the economy. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. If your big corporate strategy is to boost your shareholders' profits, your CEO's bonuses, by moving jobs out, well, we're going to make sure you not only pay full U.S. taxes on those profits, but we're going to guarantee we're going to add a 10 percent offshoring penalty surtax to your bill. That was presidential candidate Joe Biden, of course. He was speaking yesterday in Warren, Michigan, about his plan to ensure manufacturing jobs stay in this country. Welcome now a Biden supporter, former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick, who is now co-chair of American Bridge 21st Century. So, Governor, thank you so much for being with us. Give us your explanation of what Joe Biden is trying to do economically for this country, different from President Trump. Well, David, I think uh, as with all of Joe Biden's policies, uh, he puts people first. Uh, and that should surprise no one. He comes from people who work. He was raised around people who work for a living. And so I think what he's talking about by emphasizing growing jobs for Americans versus growing jobs for people overseas is right down the line for him. And he understands, I'll also say, uh, as, uh, as I do as a former governor and as a former uh, as a former person in business, that you have to invest if you want growth. And that means that everybody's going to have to contribute a little more um, to get a little more. And we have been starving ourselves uh, in the ways uh, necessary to cause uh, long-term lasting economic growth. So the former vice president, presidential candidate Joe Biden, has been fairly explicit in some big programs he's proposing, whether it's in the energy sphere, whether it's in Buy America, a number of things which cost money, as you suggest, Governor. Uh, is this a good time to raise taxes even on the supposedly wealthier or the corporations, given where we are economically? Well, it's never a good time. Hmm. Uh, you know, there's always an argument against uh, uh, against taxes, and we always treat them as if they are some sort of you know, penalty instead of what they are, which is the which is the price of civilization, the cost of civilization. And there will be trades, of course. But again, if we want sustained economic growth that reaches everyone out to the middle and the marginalized and not just up to the well-connected, then we have to invest. And what does that mean? It means uh, investing in education. It means investing in, uh, in innovation and investing in infrastructure. And those are things we have been starving for a long time in every corner in, uh, in various degrees of our, of our country. So if we want um, real economic and social justice, that means that we're going to have to invest in ourselves. Uh, and everyone has to do that. There are different strategies for, uh, for getting there. I'll tell you. Um, uh, having spent uh, most of my life in the uh, my professional life in the private sector, and some of that as a senior executive or a board member of private companies, um, rarely do companies actually make investment decisions on the strength of the tax code. Uh, that's a that's a uh, you know that's a benny on top. Um, the question is, what's the long term return uh, going to be? And I think the same is true when it comes to growing opportunity. Uh, for everyone. Governor, I think we all voraciously consume polls, even as we know we can't always trust them. You have a lot of experience with that. But if you look at the polls, uh, Joe Biden has been doing well nationally in a lot of the battleground states on almost every subject, except that President Trump continues to have a lead last time I saw with handling the economy. Why is that? Can Joe Biden overcome that? You know, I think we have a lot. First of all, he can and he should. He deserves to overcome that. I am I say that as uh, as someone who is skeptical of polls, as it sounds like you are, uh, David, <laughs> and history has certainly taught us to be. Uh, but I will say that um, you know, if you look hard at the kinds of economic indicators that President Trump bragged about before uh, the before the pandemic, 
Remember, unemployment was low, and that sounds good, and for many people it is, but it's true only if you count both or all three of the low-wage jobs people have just as high. What we want is growth that goes deeper, is broader, and is more uh, sustainable, and that means we have to invest in it. And by the way, if you look historically, uh, economic growth of that kind, lasting and sustainable and meaningful for more people, has been greater under Democratic leadership historically than it has under Republican uh, leadership. It was under Obama uh, and, uh, uh, and is uh, less true uh, today. So I think um, there is a certain amount of kind of, uh, if you will, sort of stale narrative about Democrats that we don't understand or believe in economic uh, growth and the importance of that in an economy and in a society that is organized around the idea of opportunity. Um, I think we have to overcome that. And I think that uh, this president is taking some advantage uh, of that without actually having the goods. We have the goods and we're gonna make that case. Uh, Governor, spend a minute with us on American Bridge 21st Century, which is your co-chair of now. As I understand, you're focusing on, among other things, battleground states and even swing counties. How are you doing that? Well, we're trying to address, um, uh, you know, in, on the theory that uh, that I believe Democrats should should talk to everybody, the people who agree with us, the people who don't, the people who sometimes do, the folks who never do, and the folks who just have checked out entirely. And American Bridge has a strategy very focused on uh, folks who voted once or twice uh, for Obama and in 2016 uh, for candidate Trump. And the idea is not to shame them for that vote but instead elicit from them their own feelings, their own views uh, of disappointment, of frustration uh, in the wake of, that, uh, of the president's uh, election and create a permission structure, neighbor to neighbor, where they in their own voices tell their, uh, their stories. And it's been very, very effective. Uh, and I, among other things, to convey the idea that, um, that we as Democrats, as a party, uh, and his fellow Americans aren't giving up on anybody. Well, to that point, I mean, racial justice, racial inequality have become really important issues this year, given what's happened uh, in a lot of our cities across the country. And uh, we actually have a viewer who's been listening to us who's written a question, which I think is quite intriguing. The question is, can systems manufacture equality? Can we get better racial justice through our systems? Yes, we can. First of all, we have to understand that uh, what the roots are of some of our systems, that, uh, you know, differences in, uh, in credit decisions, in housing uh, decisions, habits we have about how we decide to, to hire and from where we're going to uh, recruit. Many, many of these have roots that either go deep in racist practices or are, are tainted by those. And we have to be willing to examine those and examine those with an open mind and an open, uh, open heart. I think the time for that is now. I think the, one of the reasons, if I may, uh, David, for why the time feels so right is that uh, the economic insecurity or, and social isolation, the, the uh, anxiety or, or depression, um, which has been experienced for generations uh, by black Americans is now being experienced by people all over the country from every background. And so in a way, there's a kind of confluence of, uh, of tragedies um, that require us to examine whether the structure we have, whether the economy and social expectations we have are actually working in a country dedicated as we mean to be to equality, opportunity, and fair play. Okay, Governor, I really appreciate your spending time with us today. It was a great pleasure. It's Deval Good Patrick. Evening. He is former Democratic governor of Massachusetts and co-chair of American Bridge 21st Century. Coming up, we talk about the devastating wildfires destroying huge portions of Northern California and Oregon with someone who lives there and has fought for the climate for years. He is Tom Steyer, investor, philanthropist, and founder of NextGen America. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It is hard to comprehend the scale of the wildfires raging through Northern California and Oregon. They exceed anything in recorded history, and they may just be getting started as we head into a dry and hot autumn. Welcome now someone who lives there, Tom Steyer. He has spent much of his career trying to bring about fundamental change to address the climate change that underlies much of what we are seeing now. He founded Farallon Capital as well as Next Gen America. So welcome, Tom. Give us a sense of how bad it is, because I think it's hard for us to comprehend on the East Coast. Well, let me give you a couple parameters, David, so that people can kind of get their arms around it. We've had wildfires in California that have so far burned 2.3 million acres this year. We've never had a year where 2 million acres have burned and we have two more months of extreme fire danger with the famous Santa Ana winds bringing hot waves of uh, air across the state. So we're, we continue to be at severe risk. The cost of those fires so far has been estimated to be about $400 billion. And those fires have followed extreme heat waves, record-breaking heat waves that have included what people believe is the hottest temperature ever recorded on the planet Earth, which was in Death Valley of over 130 degrees. So what we're seeing is a much larger amount of California at risk of fire for a longer period of the year. And as a result, we're seeing record acres being burned. But I think yesterday, as someone who lives in San Francisco, it really was as if the sun never rose. There was so much ash in the air that at noon, it looked as if it were 10 o'clock at night. It was dark, streets were lit by street lamps, and you could see that this was in some way a physical explanation that we're in a climate emergency here in California. And really, we're in a climate emergency across the United States and across the globe. So, Tom, I, th I don't think it's an exaggeration to say you've been saying something like this is coming if we don't act and act firmly and quickly on climate. Uh, what has brought it about? I mean, I, I think it's obvious to most of us it's got to be something about the climate that's happening here that's exacerbating this. Well, I mean, we've seen temperatures go up around the world, and the results of that are, fire. you know, it's, it is almost biblical. We're seeing fires and floods and droughts, and we're seeing human suffering. I mean, obviously, this is happening in California during a, you know, COVID-19 pandemic, so that the people who are suffering here who's houses are burning down are also people who are already in extremis as a result of the pandemic and as a result of the, you know, sharp economic slowdown associated with that pandemic. So really, we're in a situation where there are a lot of painful things coming together at the same time, which definitely, you know, require a concerted governmental response across the board to support the people of California and to support the people of the United States. So, Tom, when you were running for president not that long ago, you said the first thing you'd do when you got elected, it would be number one item on your agenda would be addressing the climate. And, and I, I ask this with some trepidation, is it almost too late? Because we've built in so much global warming already in the system, we can't just flip a switch and turn it off. We can't, that's true, David, but it is never too late. You know, we can always we are in a tougher position with regards to the natural world and with regards to climate than I think scientists ever expected we'd be in the year 2020. You know, if you look at the projections, we're at the extreme outer end in a bad way of where we are in the natural world. But to be fair, human ingenuity, American ingenuity, American technology has also moved faster than people would have predicted. And so, Yes, we have a bigger crisis at this point than people expected, but our ability to deal with that crisis is also more powerful. And you may know I've been working with the Biden campaign, and it, really, Joe Biden's climate plan is very aggressive, very you know, broad-based, 
And it is the kind of thing that we need. We are in a situation where we've got to pull together and act on this. I, I you know, we've got to stop talking about it. We got to stop discussing whether it's happening. The time for action is right now. It's, you know, as the saying is, it's not time, it's not almost time, it's past time for us to move on this very aggressively. At the same time, briefly here, Tom, do both parties bear some of the responsibility here? Because let's be frank, Democrats have had a position of leadership in California for a while. Well, you know, if you look at this, David, it's a global problem. Hmm. And so California has been has had the most progressive energy laws and regulations in the world. But we're about 1% of CO2 emissions in the world. Mm. The United States is about 15% of CO2 emissions in the world. Right. For us to solve this problem, we right. need American action, right. we need American leadership, yeah. and we need to pull other countries right. with us along right. to make the kinds right. of changes yep. that will preserve right. a safe world. Yep. And people keep thinking Tom, it's like way in the future. It's now. Tom, Tom, thank you so much. Great to have you with us. That's Next Gen Climate Action founder Tom Steyer. And this is Bloomberg.